What do you think, Nate? You figured out the room or what? Oh, yeah. We're going down what? Two cylinders, adding a turbo. Yeah, we'll be fine. My biggest worry is this, which is gonna go away anyway. Got a big AC condenser on there. It's taking up space. Who needs AC? This is the golden air. No AC in the you, golden era. Yeah, you just sweat it out in the 80s. That's why they had sweatbands. I think our engine hoist is from the 80s too. Four-cylinder engines were relegated as low-power workhorses for a significant portion of their existence. Base model cars used them, while better trims were equipped with six- and eight-cylinder power plants. The adoption of turbochargers and the 16-valve head turned the idea of a paltry four-cylinder on its head as they became some of the most fearsome engines to see competition. DTM races weren't an exception, as Ford's Cosworth-built Turbo 4 and the screaming, naturally aspirated mills from Mercedes and BMW wiped the floor with the competition. Those DTM legends birthed a generation of fast sedans with those small, high-performing engines and started a trend that hasn't stopped. Since then, the performance four-cylinder engine has become the most popular platform across nearly every major manufacturer. Hot hatches and rally-inspired vehicles have carried on the development of the platform, and now even luxury brands have joined the fray. Mercedes, BMW, Audi, and even Porsche all have their own version of the performance four-cylinder. While the team at FCP Euro clings to the spirit of DTM with their engine choice, they don't have to play within the same Group A rule set limiting their imagination. Instead, they're taking a page out of Mercedes' modern touring car playbook to give the ultimate tribute more power and flair. This engine was an A45 AMG, and obviously it was horizontally mounted, and it's an all-wheel drive car, so we had the axle passing through right here. We're gonna be taking the engine, we're gonna be turning it 90 degrees and putting it in the 190 here. So uh, we're gonna pull some of this stuff off, um, and we're just putting it in, we're gonna just drop it in there, we're gonna see what it looks like, and uh, figure it out from there. You got a star so we can detension this? Yeah, go like that. Yep. Okay, here we go. I mean, I really have to say, this engine is a beautiful piece of engineering. It's like, it actually is kind of exciting to be able to properly expose it without plastic covers all around it. You know what I mean? There's a lot of really cool aluminum pieces on it. Just the way it's plumbed, it's very smart and simple. Now I'm coming down slow. Why not? For, uh... Can you it? Pull it forward an inch? All right, Danny, you just gotta stand there. Okay. Hold it just like that. Until the project's Yep. Until we're done with the project. So I think looking at this, if we are to leave this oil pan in, obviously we need to do cross member reconfiguration. We won't have a booster. So we, all these lines will be gone um, with the exception that we'll have power steering lines, but we can run them real tight up on the frame rail. We do need to figure out power steering pump. Radiator will be right here. The only issue with the other one is the other radiator is going through the, that spot where the, the water to air intercooler is, mm -hmm. this line. So this radiator line will have to come around. We'll probably want to do a hard line up on the frame rail from here and then have a stubby to the radiator. And we do have to figure out the turbo whether we're going to 180 it or leave it like this. Yeah. I'm looking here, like if we were to leave it like this, we could technically run the exhaust out like this. The only issue being that it's going to get really hot. We have a lot of hydraulic things going on over here. Yeah, yeah. And oil and hot and heat don't necessarily go. It wants to be in here. Yeah. It literally is it's saying, leave me. Yeah. This is my new home, I'm happy now. Look at this. You see the shirt? The shirt, they're speaking to each other. Good old girl. For all of you following along, this is probably the first time you've seen this car because this car hasn't done anything since significant since 2018. This car was built in the end of 2016 to race in American endurance racing. It was one of like two 
available six-speed manual C300 rear-wheel drives in the country. And so what we're gonna do today is, it actually needs a clutch anyway. I mean, it has a bunch of custom bits in the transmission, uh, flywheel, clutch, all of that. And we're pretty certain that the transmission from this car will actually fit onto the back of the AMG 133 over there. And we're gonna test fit it, and then we're also gonna test fit some of the flywheel stuff. So we can figure out how to bolt a manual transmission up to an engine that really never had a manual transmission on it. So uh, let's jump in. Good. It's gonna bolt right in, dude. Let's go see if it fits. All right, so here we are. We have the engine that's gonna be going in this beast, um, and we pulled all of the automatic transmission flywheel, which is a pretty complicated piece of equipment right here. Now we have the flywheel from the C300, and we're gonna go see if this fits. I have preemptively measured this diameter right here, um, which matched, and this pin matched, so we're pretty good there. Another thing to note is on this 2010 C300, we have the crankcase positioning going on right here. That's why this is machined so silly like this, basically to pick up what position the crank, crankshaft's at. Now on these newer models, this is from a 2019, um, you can see this has this really cool little sheet metal ring. It's almost like a little ABS ring. Um, and that lives on the back of the crankshaft and that gives a signal right here to the sensor and tells the engine what point of rotation it's at. So, so as we have to figure out how to manufacture a flywheel for this, we don't even have to worry about this anymore, um, which is gonna save a lot of time and money in, in the manufacturing process. Uh, so let's see if this thing fits. So it fits. It's like our ring gear is in the right location for where the starter is gonna have to get it. Um, obviously that's something we need to consider. On the 272s, starter sits on the engine side. Obviously you can see there's no cutouts here for starters to sit on the engine side. So we're gonna have to either machine a little piece of the block out, or we're gonna have to figure something out there. But yeah, it looks like we got our pilot bearing for this transmission. We have a flywheel. We should have crank position. Uh, the only thing that looks that's different is this bolt pattern is different. I can see that this hole lines up, this hole lines up, this hole lines up, and this hole lines up. These two do not. Uh, so we'll have to sort through that, but these are uh, the teething pains we expected. So this, this is pretty cool. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw two bolts in this thing real quick just to make sure this flywheel doesn't go anywhere. And then we're going to see if the transmission mates up. It definitely is off a little bit. We got to get we got to get the dowel pins right because it's a little bit offset to one side. We got one here. That's good. And so we just need to make sure we can get a clutch in there that's going to fit right and Basically, if the engine's perfectly upright, the transmission's happy. You can rock transmissions over like five, 10 degrees from their normal spot. You don't wanna to go too far though, because then the oiling system doesn't work in it, because they just really splash lubricated. So we have Danny here. He is one of our Mercedes specialists that helps out on the marketing and the catalog side. He knows way more about the Mercedes specific stuff than I do. And I'll let Danny kind of introduce himself and talk about some of the stuff he's figured out on this before we got, even got started. When the first topic kind of came up about how we're going to run a transmission, what transmission we're going to run, there was a lot of discussion kind of going back and forth, I think. Uh, this coming with the dual clutch that it does come with, it's very fast, but it doesn't really have that awesome tribute to the golden era that we're going for here. So in terms of thinking of what we could kind of do with that, uh, my mind kind of went to one of our favorites here, our C300. Uh, it was kind of neat that it had the factory manual transmission. We started kind of thinking about what would be involved in getting that to made up and had the suspicion that it wouldn't be all that intense. So as you can kind of see over here, it went together almost like it was meant to be in some capacity. Let's come back tomorrow, Danny. Let's get this engine up on the engine stand and we'll see if we can get this thing in here, see how far back we can send it. Heck yeah. down maybe another half inch. The only place we're struggling is on the oil pan right now. Does look like the transmission is going to get pretty tight yeah. once we get back about another five or six inches. I don't know if we need to go back that much more than that though. 
obviously doing custom drive shafts and stuff, we should always try to get the engine as far as back as possible. But we also want to avoid tearing up the entire transmission tunnel, the entire firewall, and redoing all that. You know, that's a lot of metal work that's going to be a lot of time. And so we want this to be as bolted as possible. Let's just see if we can wiggle it back a little more past the track rod. You can see like the bell housing is basically on the track rod right now. We're going to go a lot more. So the oil pan is the issue right now, which isn't, this is hopefully not the oil pan we're going to be using. but we're pulling this front wheel drive oil pan with this front sump and area for the drive shaft. And we're gonna go to the rear wheel drive sump, which will be a big sump right here. Hopefully position things a little bit better for a rear wheel drive configuration on this engine. Uh, now this engine was never rear wheel drive, but the basis of this engine, this block, was used in a rear wheel drive format in Europe. So we're kind of basing it on that. There we go. Hopefully we don't throw oil all over ourselves. Look at that. To me, that looks like that flange is exactly the same. With their extensive knowledge, the team determined that the M133 engine is part of a family that includes the M274, a longitudinally mounted rear wheel drive version of the same engine architecture. Critically, its oil pan's main sump is at the opposite end, so it'll clear a front cross member like that of the 190E. Thanks to the shared architecture, the M274's components should be just what the Golden Era project needs. All right, so first thing I'm looking at here, everything seems to be good. But when I position the pan all the way forward where it's supposed to go, you can see this little tongue is hitting that pan or hitting that pulley. And looking at the front wheel drive one doesn't have that. Uh, so I'm going to cut this off and we're going to see if it fits. Attempt number two. Oh, it's already better. You can just, yeah. It snapped in. Yeah, it's like Legos. That's all cars are, they're just Legos. It looks good. I mean, looking around the gap, looks solid, looks like it fits, no problem. Obviously, we have to sort out the baffling and windage tray situation, make sure that's all good. But what I'm gonna do now is just grab a small little wrench, snug these four down, make sure it sits nice and tight, and then we're gonna go test it in the car. This is, this is gonna be the moment of truth where we figure out if we have to trim the subframe or not. PCV system for, for somebody. Hello? California? Who is, Who is it? It's California on the line. They noticed that our uh, emissions have been removed. Listen, oh, um, this is actually not uh, gonna be on the road, so don't worry about it. It'll be like seven trees max. Thank you. It's always gonna be more efficient. <laughs> no, we need that cell. <laughs> We're over the subframe now, in the in the front. So can you get back at all? Back towards you? Y yeah. Okay. I mean, that's the biggest problem is getting the thing back. Because the other thing we could do here, which I'm thinking, if we're going to be putting a steering rack on this thing, what we do is we just cut out the midsection of the subframe, put two eighth-inch plates on either side, capture nuts on them, and then do a pl plate with a like a piece of DOM tube on it. And so basically, you just have like. A, a removable midsection. So when you have to do this again, you unbolt the midsection, pull it out, yeah. slide it in, bolt it back in. And then we could, fab we could work on, or use that to fabricate the rack mounts. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking too. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. You were thinking that? Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know if we agreed on the color yet. Oh. Okay, you're gonna have to do that on Hello? the Hello, who is it? Hop in the Stockholm, man. No, there will not be any water on these pipes. It'll be straight antifreeze with distilled water. We will not be harming oh, the fish when we drink. Only distilled. Yep. Yeah, I'll let them know. No, I can't I can't help you with the freaking thing we took off earlier. I I took it out of the trash. It's still here. Seven so trees, Max. The engine. This car I can't talk right now. We're here. Come on. Technically.
<laughs> the M274 oil pan was just what the team needed to keep moving forward, but it led them right into their next challenge. So we're going to be cutting out this middle section across member. Uh, you can see that this is double plated here. See all the spot welds? So we have a double plate for where the engine mount sits. Uh, this I highly doubt is double plated. So we're going to try to cut this middle section out. We're going to weld some eighth inch plates in here as butt plates. And then we'll make sure there's captive hardware on there so we can have a bolt-in center cross member that comes out. Um, I've taken a couple of measurements center line to center line on this is 520 millimeters. Um, and then we're cutting out this middle section. So just basically make sure that when I cut, if anything springs out or springs in, um, we have that baseline measurement. So um, let's give it a go. What's there to lose? What's up, friend? Yep, exactly. You like that? Look, look how nice and straight those cuts are. A rack and pinion steering rack was going to replace the antiquated steering box found in every 190E for better feel and control on the track. However, that was going to require some clever engineering. Oops. I'm sorry, camera. Generally speaking, I'm pretty happy with where it's sitting right now. It'll also make the steering system, which we have to fabricate, much easier. Um, and that's really the next step is we need to go grab the steering parts that we need to fabricate the steering system on this car. So one of the goals we're trying to do is we want these pivot points to be about the same. So there's this thing in racing and chassis dynamics called bump steer. So imagine if you had your steering rack mounted up here and your chassis arm mounted here. And as things move, they're different lengths. As that movement goes, the distance has actually changed slightly. So just a geometric function, right? And so Oftentimes it happens is the steering will go like this as you know, as they go over bumps, stuff like that, and that's called bump steer. But you do want to try to keep your pivot points all sort of on the same planes and your lengths approximately the same, um, because that's really gonna cut down a bump steer and just make the car more enjoyable to drive on track. So you can see here, the center line of that tie rod right here is almost lined up perfectly with the pivot point on that control arm. And that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. And if we see where the Right here in that neutral state, that ball joint, right was where my thumb is, that's where the pivot point is on the inner tie rod, right where the same pivot point on the control arm. This steering rack literally could not fit better. Blue tape's away way life. Perfect. I don't know how equal this is. If this is steered totally, totally equal or not. You can see we got a pivot right there, right where my finger is. So the ball joint is almost perfectly lined up with that. We got a pivot right here, which is a little bit to the left. So probably want to scoot this thing over to the right. But I think that's about it. It's about centered. When we build, rebuild this cross member, we're going to come forward with it and we're going to build some brackets to hold the steering rack in place. Kind of tie everything together in one, one fabrication session. Obviously we need to have the steering shaft needs to come down here and make this. We still need to have some structure here because this is where the controller arm bolts through it. Um, so my idea is if we section out a piece of this, I can get some four inch tube, which is about the size of this, and we can just lay that down and we can actually build a channel inside this, basically a half moon channel inside this for the steering shaft to go, um, but also retain all the structure in this box so that we don't lose it for this. And then we can connect it together with the weld and mount. That's my thought. Sounds like it could work. So whenever you're doing eighth inch plates on thin sheet metal, a little tip, always leave yourself an overhang, just a teeny bit. It's always gonna be easier to weld into the thicker metal, it's gonna be the eighth inch plate in this case. So if we leave a little bit of a valley here, we can actually just fill this with weld. So we'll just kind of fill this in, 
we will edge around the edge. So I just, I just drew it up in CAD right here yep. real quick. Now I come over to my 3D printer and we mock up the, uh, the design right here. So this is my high tech 3D printer. So basically we'll have one here, we'll have the other one right there, and then we will connect them with a piece of roll bar tubing. Easy peasy. See, I've taken my first design, iteration one, and I've added this little extra sec section on it, and we can put a bolt right there. So along with these bolts, really lock this whole thing in. Right, let's go trace the roll bar tube. Perfect. Now let's go look at it on the car. All right, let's make a metal. Waste very little material. All right, let's go test them out in the car. So I'm really thinking like one's gonna be right here. Second one will be right here. Ish. Third one will be right here. Dose. So basically locked in the nuts on the back side, so we don't need a wrench. We can pop them loose, make sure everything's nice and free. And then now this whole panel can go get welded into the car. In the golden era of DTM competition, manufacturers were tightly restricted by the rules they raced under. If it wasn't on the road car, they likely couldn't use it. Those restrictions spurred on road car development and led to both Mercedes and BMW to include radical tech like self-leveling suspension and anti-lock brakes. On the other hand, the Golden Era project is only a tribute, unrestricted by the FIA, so modifying suspension and steering systems will allow FCP Euro to retain the spirit of the era while bringing those systems up to modern standards. Now that we have the engine in location, the goal is to sort of start fabricating all of these mounts to lock the engine in location. So uh, first up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get that transmission brace fabbed up so we can get this out of here and get the strap out of here. That means we can go up and down as much as we want on the lift and we can start fabricating the front motor mounts. Golden era, training mount coming up. You just have these tiny little welds holding these washers nice and centered there. What that's gonna do is allow this bolt to center this bushing between these two holes. So you can see I can take this. Um, and in addition to that, we're actually running two washers in between just to make sure we have enough space. Give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. Just like that. Now we're gonna throw a nut on the other side and this can be snug down in the car. So there we go. So now this you can see is notched out here. This little special notch, that's to fit in the frame rail. We can get everything nice and square. Obviously I've given some room so we can move forward and backwards. But that's what it's gonna look like right there. Now you can see both mounting points on either frame rails. Now we just need to connect all the dots.
Do you guys want to build a piece of this with me? Should I walk you through the steps and how we do this? All right, let's do it. Uh, so first we're starting out with just some raw material here. I want it to land on the bar a little bit back from the edge so these two welds basically don't overlap each other. So this is gonna make it nice and strong here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to go and saw this off right here so I don't have any significant excess material and I'm not working with a big long piece of pipe. All right, we're gonna wipe this guy down. We just wiped down the outside of the pipe, but we definitely wanna clean the inside. If you look down there, you can see uh, there's some sediment and stuff in there. Obviously, that's not gonna affect us right now, but when we go, go to weld it, if there's oil or debris in there, that's gonna contaminate our welds and make it not as pretty. So definitely wanna clean the inside of the pipe as well. Look at all that stuff coming out of there. Um, because I did this on an angle, I'm gonna take this, hold it perfectly horizontal, just give it a little scrape, and that's gonna be my center line. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing up here, because when I go to drill through this, Obviously, I want everything lining up and not being tweaked at all. So we need to make sure the pipe is clocked accordingly. So now what I'm doing is I'm just getting my line that we've created here. You can see that my Sharpie line and getting that perpendicular to the drill bit. Uh, but obviously, you can see we need to make some adjustments up top to make sure this is going to work. All right, so now what I've done is I've made it so I can cut down and you can see I just outline, you can see that that Sharpie line is aligned. You can see right there. So now we're just gonna cut straight down uh, with this hole saw and magic will happen. All this little thin stuff here, uh, we wanna get, get rid of, we'll grind that right off because you don't wanna weld this thin area because that's not gonna give it any structural integrity. Once we notch this and allow this to drop down, we should have a really nice fitment right there. So you can see I'm right on center line. So what I'm gonna do, is now we're gonna set it up perpendicular and we're gonna just basically plunge straight through here, put a nice U shape on that so it ties right in there. Modern Mercedes engine mounts are built for comfort, luxury, and occasionally speed, but each has some kind of rubber or fluid damper within them. The Golden Era project isn't a modern Mercedes, nor is it a street car. It's a purpose-built track machine. Using steel plate and tubing exclusively for the engine mounts eliminates all damping forces and will allow the M133 to put every bit of its power to the rear wheels. Now let's go clean it up. Now it's time to tie it all together. So we got this thing pretty well tacked up, so we have multiple tacks on every pipe. Obviously it's all tied together. Now we're going to build the other side, um, and then we'll final weld this thing up, and we'll have a motor mount. in the stand test all 80 pounds yep we're good dude. <laughs> yeah uh, this is 85 i had barbecue for lunch today and i my, i finished thing. my whole thing <laughs> yeah man this thing is solid not bad for just tacked in let's move on from this because i can't look at this anymore because i spent way too long looking at that with the engine and transmission mounted in place it's time to address the suspension <laughs> More Mercedes catalog sleuthing has come up with a handful of other parts that will help turn the 190E from an 80s relic into a modernized DTM tribute machine. To see just how they do it, follow along on the next episode of the Golden Era Project.